thank you, Ankur, uh, for uh, inviting me. Uh, the CRISP conference looks like a great meeting. Um, I'll get to the point. I think uh, when you say stent failure, you think of two things. One is uh, stent thrombosis. The other is in stent restenosis. I think uh, we all know that we talk about uh, stent thrombosis in terms of acute, subacute, late, and very late. But I take the liberty of looking at ISR in a similar temporal fashion where I call it early, intermediate, and late. Now, the problem is it's very difficult to differentiate between late, very late, and the early, late, very late stent thrombosis and the early instant restenosis at times. And the only difference in this entire spectrum is the time when it makes the presentation from the index procedure. And that's relevant. It's relevant because when you talk of late and very late stent thrombosis as against early instant restenosis, you see on the left-hand side, you see more thrombus, you see NIH, you see new atherosclerosis beginning, and you see calcium, very, less, very, very less calcium. Almost, the calcium is almost always on the outside of the stent because of the inexpansion. As you go towards the intermediate and late instant restenosis, which is to your right of the curve, which is here, you realize that calcium is predominant within the stent. In fact, beyond 24 months, it is almost a rule that in all ISRs you will see calcium within the stent unless there's an exception. New atherosclerosis is seen. NIH is very, I mean, you see that that's a part of the story, but there's less thrombus. The thrombus isn't much. There's organized thrombus of various levels. It behaves like fibrous tissue. It has implications because in all this, there is this underlying mechanism of an under-expanded stent, which we need to deal with, whether we took a stent thrombosis or ISAR, this is almost a common theme. And the reason is the impact of therapy is so important that in the left group where the thrombus is more, you see slow flow distal embolization, which I'll show you. And in the right, it's difficult to cross and it's difficult to expand in these ISRs. And I'll show you those as well. So having said this, and set the stage of what I'm trying to tell you, I'm going to go case-wise in terms of how we navigate this whole thing. Now, when we navigate ISR, we talk about focal, we talk about edge, or it could be diffuse, which we see. And of course, the question is, is it a CTO, non-CTO, whether there's calcium? I think this is, this is what differentiates one from the other. And of course, there's this on the far right is the un under-expanded stent. Under-expanded stent could be right in the realms of an acute angioplasty. You're doing an angioplasty and you can't expand a stent, so that's acute. And then an under-expanded stent that comes in the form of an ISR or a stent failure that you recognize as a problem. So how do we navigate through this entire complex subset, which is so heterogeneous? So I'll break it up in what I think is a very simplistic approach. So let's look at focal an edge ISR without any calcium. And this is a representation. An 80-year-old CTO we did uh, many, uh, a few years ago, prior COVID. And what we, we, it took us a long time, uh, two hours of crossing. Uh, we finally put in these stents in. It was IVUS guided. And we got an ISR at the end of one year. Uh, this is uh, within at the 10 to 11 month period. Very focal um, and with angina. We did an OCT. What did we find? That there was that focal in expansion of the stent. There was new intermal hyperplasia, soft tissue. OCT con concluded that in a 3.25 vessel size, the stent was expanded to three almost on either sides and 2.2 in the center. When we did this angioplasty, we probably missed out on that area to expand it well. So this is where it's very important to kind of scrutinize your images post-PCI frame by frame to understand deformation and as well as expansion in long stance. So what was the plan? The plan was to go ahead and put in a cutting balloon, dilate, and choices were we could have either put in a drug loading balloon or a DES. We decided we'll put in a DES. Whenever you have long stance in whatever artery and you're doing it focal, you're using cutting balloons which have blades, I suggest please take a guidezilla because the blades are likely to st get stuck in the proximal struts and then deform them as you do it. So we did that exactly. We did a 3-0 cutting. 
18 atmospheres, followed it with a focal stent, expanded it, proved that on the OCT, completed the job with this. He's, he, he's done well. He's done well for four years, and now he has CA prostate. In 2011, I opened this LAD CTO right at the ostium and put in multiple stents, and uh, put in two stents proximally and one distally. When we put in this in 2000, he had angina in 2021, and he had just this isolated lesion in the distal LED, and it was an ISR, almost like a subtotal. We struggled, we had an UB3 wire which crossed, and barely crossed, I couldn't take it any further, and once that happened, the microcatheter just would not go in. Um, a 1.5 balloon, 1.2 balloon failed. So we used an eczema laser with saline. The saline did not cross, so we used a contrast. At that time, we were using diluted contrast. Uh, we started with 30%, I mean 30%, 50%, and then went on to 100%. And with that, we made a little bit of a headway, which allowed us to then dilate serially with the balloon, get a cutting balloon there, dilate it. We ended up with a jugulating balloon in this case. So what did the eczema laser do? It facilitated the initiation of a procedure by creating a channel which allowed me to put in my another device, which is a balloon, and then followed by a cutting balloon and a DEB. So facilitation is a very important thing in these uncrossable lesions for ELCA. In 2009, this young man underwent an angioplasty to the mid-LED, and that could be questioned in this current day and age. However, that was the result before and after. In 2014, he presented with a proximal, more proximal lesion there, involved the diagonal branch. He underwent another angioplasty uh, with a bifurcation stenting as seen over here. That was in 2014. Presented with ACS, um, and we did a CT, and this CT showed a soft lesion at the edge of the stent. This corresponds to what we believe was a raised block burden at the proximal edge of the previous stent. So this was the lesion clinically. When we looked at the IVUS, uh, what did we find? We found that the stent, the proximal edge of the stent, which was done, the bifurcation stent, uh, was an inadequate pot with a serious, um, in a, in a 9.5 uh, reference area, we had an expand, the stent was only expanded to 6.6 .6 millimeters square. Uh, there was a huge plaque burden at the edge, and, and this was an acute Gorsh syndrome because you can see there was a lot of, uh, uh, attenuated plaque that was within the proximal edge of the stent. So the IVIS or the imaging established clarity on why this thing happened. And I think what we did was our, our, our choices in treatment were very simple. We used a Wolverine at that time, 3.5 by 6, 18 atmospheres, got the expanded stent, identified a landing zone of there and expanded this, got the ostium which was around 6 to around 10.3 with a well-expanded stent and, and based it, when, when crossed it over into the left main and uh, optimized it. This man is doing well now, it's six years past, it's almost uh, five years past now. Hopefully we've done the right thing for him this time around. So when you look at focal, you have these options. You have this bifurcation of CTO, non-CTO, calcified, non -CTO. I mean, when you do that, the grid says that you could, and I showed you cases where you could take this path, which is very simplistic, where you just take a cutting balloon, scoring balloon, an NC balloon, whatever you choose to, dilate, and then once you do that, you either put in a juggling balloon or a stent, or in one case where I had to use an LCA to get an entry and then get to the same path. So I think the final destination path is the same. The method is designed to convenience in terms of how you facilitate your angioplasty and various devices can be used. So in the focal lesion, crossing can be a challenge. ELCA is my preferred strategy today in that, in that region. Nevertheless, cutting balloon inflations are preferred to improve MSAs over routine balloons, and I can show you there's some scanty data from various small studies to support that. And DB might be an option in certain cases, as I showed. Going on to diffuse. Diffuse CTOs, but no calcium. So there's no calcium at this bed. And these are the patients who come in with a diffuse CTO at the end of a year, between year and six months after. So between 12 months and 18 months is their presentation. Most of them don't have calcium, and that's the story. So here, 
There's a story of a gentleman who presented to me in 2008. I was at Bombay Hospital at that time with cardiogenic shock. Post-surgery, the lima to the LED had failed. The LED was occluded. This was the sole supplying artery. And uh, this right coronary artery, as you can send, we, he came in with this right coronary artery. And we put, in, we put in cipher stents on the far left. In 2010, two years later, he came back with very acute symptoms. And we saw that we had an ISR, this image on above. We put in two more Erolimus stents at that time and concluded the state. In 2012, we got back and he came back with this ISR, which is right here. And at that time, uh, we put in a stent, we corrected this right coronary artery. And um, we took this opportunity at that time to go ahead and do a retrograde opening of the LAD in 2012. Now, the LED supported us at that time, and then it allowed him to be okay. And in 2021, he presented with exertion-related angina over the last three years. So three years he's been having angina. It's progressed to the point that he wants to deal with it now. So this is the RCA. And this is our, we, we went once we went in, we put in our 1.4 ELCA at maximum 60 and 40. So we started our early on cases with lower energies, but quickly realized that in the ISR group, we don't need to go to lower energies. The maximum energy, energy is the best energy. We also realized that contrast plays an important path in bathing the laser. So it's saline bathed laser or contrast bathed laser, and contrast is absolutely important. So here we did saline because it was our early experience in 2021. We had just started lasing ISRs at that time. This is our IVAS, and what it shows is that our IVA shows that there was adequate debulking within the ISA, in, within the stent. And we were getting clean lesions, we were getting clean lines, and lumens were corresponding to the size of the catheter and almost 30% beyond. So a 1.5 catheter would cause, get us around a two millimeter lumen. So that was pretty good. And, and then there was a clean debulking of tissue that we noticed. And of course it allowed us to, after that, use cutting balloons to our various sizes, which we did in this case. And we put in two more stents, which could be questionable at this time, and, and arrived at this lesion, and he's doing well. From 2021 to now, he's been absolutely angina-free. When you get to focal and diffuse, but when they come and present themselves with STEMI or non-STEMI, and often you have seen that. One such case, you know, this patient had a STEMI, this is post-surgery, one, one of our colleagues, uh, a uh, younger interventionist uh, did this in the, in the suburbs, uh, and he put in a PCI, uh, this pre presented with an inferior uh, acute point syndrome, and two stents were placed in the RCA. Four months later, he presented to me with an acute point syndrome again, and this was the ISR. And you can see that the ISR, the right coronary artery, supplies a vein graft which goes and fills in the venous, uh, the, the circumflex territory as well, so a very large area. Now, this seemed pretty straightforward, and I thought, why not just go ahead and dilate this artery with what is conventional, uh, a, a, a normal balloon or a cutting balloon. So I favored a Wolverine at that time, and we went in with this uh, and, and expanded it to establish slow flow. We had extreme slow flow. We struggled for two and a half hours. We had to intubate this patient, put him on a balloon pump, and, and get this, and get this uh, flow back. We were lucky. Uh, we salvaged the situation. The strategy was dilate, stent resulted in slow flow. We had a similar case, again, with a four-month ISR, very progressive, which was uh, done elsewhere and came to us. Here we used the strategy of an eczema laser. We used an eczema laser, and post-eczema laser, with, a, with contrast, we realized that cutting balloon expands, and, and then a drug eluding balloon, proximally, and uh, just a drug eluding balloon, and this is our result. So what did laser do in this case? It actually helped us take away that acute coronary syndrome impact of slow flow. And I think now we are pretty confident that that's the way to go in, these, in this presentation. This is uh, relevant from this case as well. Similarly, an inferior wall infarct, which we stented many years ago, came back to us in 2002. This we did as a live case. And this was thrombus filled case. And these ISRs are dealt best with LK, LK and followed by Wolverines, and uh, a choice can be made whether to put in a drug eluding balloon or another stent based on the amount of clearance of tissue within the stent that you obtain. <clears throat> Here we improved areas of unexpanded stents from 5.9 millimeters square to 
to almost 8.4, which is reasonable. Um, when do you start getting diffuse? And we have calcified CTOs, which is like this one, where two stents were placed in the RCA, and then a few years later, two more stents in that RCA. So multiple layers of stents in that RCA, now angina, and this is your CTO, very, very calcified. So this is getting to a complexity to the far right where this is heavily calcified, and most of us would have done a, a, a rotablator to this. I'm just gonna very quickly go through this so that because it's trying to make a point. So we used an eczema laser in this case. This is off-label use with use of contrast. And, and uh, once we do that, we realize that the expected MSA was in these patients was supposed to be seven and 9.5, but in the previous PCI, it was only 3.6 and 3.7, severely un under expanded stents. And of course, post laser, when we do cutting balloon, these were expanded significantly to 7.84 and 8.41. And you can see the clearance of con the tissue, and that's the iris on the right side, which you can tell that the tissue inside is cleared up completely, and you can get away with a drug loading balloon. I'm just gonna go to the last slide, uh, the last few slides. Now, is there, is there any logic in this approach? And the logic comes from these very scanty data, which says that when you use ELCA in your PCI for preparation, you have better results than if you did not use, especially as far as MSAs are concerned in under expanded stents related to ISR. And the theory being that when you have an ISR and you do a cutting balloon dilatation inside, you do things to that soft tissue, but you do nothing to that very supported calcium when you use any balloon expandable technology. When you use contrast with laser, you create a macro, like an explosion with an acoustic pressure of almost 120 atmospheres within the stented area, along with fulguration of tissue. And this allows better expansion, which is what we have shown. Which comes to our algorithm, which says that when you have complex, especially when you have CTOs calcified, as in the center here, you see that from rotablator, we have moved on to ELCA being a single device for its use. And that, along with the cutting balloon, often gives you a great result. Of course, on times, we will have to use IVLs and we will have to use other technology. But in summary, simple focal edge diffuse ISRs, many options, dilate, deliver is easy. Uncrossable calcified ISRs, conventionally we used rotablators in the past. Potential risk of stuck and slow burrs are significant. ELCA is my preferred choice at this time. Peri and intrust end calcium is very likely to be modified with ELCA, unlike any other technology, especially when you use contrast, and may work as a single device to cross and to expand both. Successful expansion of a few, we have demonstrated quite a few of those. ISR presenting as an acute coronary syndrome, ELCA, again, as my preferred strategy, is my first device. It helps establish early flow, and I believe it reduces slow flow, and I'm, I'm hoping that in our data we'll prove that. And, of course, imaging is the key in identifying the issue and establishing the correction. Thank you.